Thank you so much. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to church. It's such a glorious day. We're so glad that you're here. We're going to begin our service right now by singing our opening chant, God is all there is. Good morning. So nice to see all of you who are here this morning for Labor Day weekend. And welcome to all of you who have joined us also via Facebook Live and Zoom. Uh, so um, we're going to begin with an opening prayer. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I thought we still have a chant. <laughs> We're going to begin with an opening prayer, but uh, before we do so, for those of you who are in the sanctuary, I know we're kind of not used to getting together as often anymore, so uh, if you would make sure that you have uh, silenced any device that might go off during the service, uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Okay, with that, let's join in prayer. Turning our attention inward, just allowing ourselves to come to that inner sanctuary at the center of our being. That place where we can know and remember the truth of our oneness with God, our oneness with all life. Because truly, there's only one life expressing itself in all the forms in creation, God's life, God's love, God's joy, abundance, wholeness, creativity, all goodness is ever present throughout creation, including within and around each and every one of us. And I know that we come together to remember that truth, to have a greater realization of our divine nature and to experience and express it more fully. And so I know that God is flowing throughout the service and every component of the service supports that intention for us to awaken to the truth of our being. I know that we feel the vibration of love coming together, the love of all of those who are of service, the love and creativity that flows through our musicians, Sam and Karen, and through our soloist, Jody, this morning. And I know that we are absolutely inspired and uplifted by the message of the divine that is spoken through Dr. Mark, that this message touches us, awakens us to that goodness within so we can carry it out from this place and experience it more fully in our day-to-day -day lives. And so I give thanks for all the blessings that we receive in this time together and in gratitude, I release this word, knowing it is so. Our time is blessed, and so it is. Together we say, Amen.
So please rise and join me in saying the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Please remain standing and let's join in our congregational song, Joy and Peace in My Heart. So this is a time in our service where we'll give ourselves five minutes to just get still and to commune with that presence that lives in all of us. So I invite you to just get comfortable and still in your chairs, to close your eyes, to turn your attention inward, and for the next five minutes, just silently repeat the mantra, God is the love that I am. God is the love that I am. Just silently repeat that over and over, and I'll bring us out of meditation in five minutes.
Christmas choose to change my way of thinking. I in consciousness use tools to move my feet, making every day. keep repeating in the circle of love, law, and truth. So I'm stepping outside of the box. journey I am bound and I'm stirring the pot oh shaking the ground erasing what is left of my yesterday on the sidewalk. A dear departed silhouette that I finally left behind. Lord knows I've made mistakes, but I've Consequences live in the effects of the past in present tenses. I am toe to toe with ghosts and know that what keeps bringing them back here is my stubborn mind that won't leave behind the image in the mirror. in the 
Good morning. Good morning. Thank you for being here. It's great to have you here in person. It's great to have you on Zoom. I'm glad you're here with us on Facebook. However you're with us, we are glad you're here. I'm going to talk a little bit today uh, about prayer. I remember when I came into metaphysics, one of the things I heard early on was that all thoughts are prayers. And I thought, wow, can that possibly be true? And as I started to study the science of my teaching, I realized that was absolutely so. Because every thought we think, every word we say, is acted upon by the law of mind action. Ernest Holmes, one of his great contributions to the New Thought movement, was that he gave us a method to pray that was different than anything that had existed before. He gave us this five-step process or, uh, that he called treatment, or spiritual mind treatment. Now, I would say that up until this point, my experience of prayer had been a lot of begging and beseeching. And, um, and I did this very consistently, and I will say, in all honesty, I had minimal results from this, but I didn't know any other way. Um, I grew up uh, praying every night before bed. Uh, we said grace before dinner every evening. Um, so prayer, I think, okay, I have no problem with that. It was one of the best things I feel like I took from the tradition I grew up in. Um, I think prayer is absolutely applicable to every area in our life, no matter what we could possibly be experiencing or going through. See, we are connected to something greater than our thinking brain and this physical body. We are a metaphysical church, and what that means is that we are interested in something that is beyond the physical. Beyond what our five senses are able to comprehend, there is a spiritual reality, and we believe that that spiritual reality is, in fact, more real than this experience on Earth right here. Now, Ernest Holmes also teaches that for there to be any real transformation, two things have to be in place, that there has to be an ongoing practice of meditation, because it's through meditation that we court the presence that is God. But he says we also have to pray in an affirmative way, because when we pray in an affirmative way, what that does is that that sets the law of mind in motion. right? So it's twofold, because he says God is both love and law. Love, a presence that we court through meditation. Law, a principle we learn to work with intelligently through the use of spiritual mind treatment. So we're connected to something greater. No, so prayer, uh, one of the ways I've often heard this is that prayer was when we talk to God and meditation is when we listen. And it's like, well, okay, I can go with that. I, I, I don't disagree with any of that. Obviously, not everybody prays the same way. And it was interesting for me when I came into Science of Mind, learning a new way to pray where I had only known begging and beseeching. You know, I, was, I, was, I groveled with the best of them, I want you to know. I did, and I was absolutely sincere in my groveling, and so therefore I did not understand why there was very minimal results. So I come into science of mind, and I realize, oh, and now there's the law in science of mind. Great, we're working with a law, a law that responds, as Ernest Holmes says, with mechanical regularity to our thinking. I love that. But now, prayer seems, for many people, well, because their idea of God, so I would say that when I was young, my idea of God was a very old white guy in the sky with a book who was just waiting for me to screw up, and it went into the book. And then later on, because I had screwed up, there would be some misfortune, all right? That was as much as I figured out about how the universe operated. Come into science of mind, and now we have God that's infinite. But what do people do with infinite God, with an infinite power, potential, present spirit? Is that they treat it like God's a Santa Claus, or a bellboy, or a hitman, you know? And so that didn't seem much more evolved 
either, you know, because you can't just say, God, I want this, God, I want that. It, it's, our way, I think, is a way that works. Okay, now, I'm sure there are other ways that works. I can't speak about them. I can only speak about the science of mind. And in the science of mind, I know that our way to pray works because it lifts us out of that cycle of begging and beseeching and, in my case, groveling. See, there is scientific evidence that no religion has a monopoly on prayer because, you know, that's one of the things you'll notice, that in all teachings, all traditions, even traditions that don't have God, those people pray. Everybody prays, it seems. So um, I think it's personal to each of us. I'm sure that there are no two people on the face of the planet who pray in exactly the same way because it's, it's, it's such an individual expression of who we are. And I believe that it's essential. It's essential to turn inward. Like I say all the time, if you don't go within, you'll go without. Because that's, that's, that's really our teaching. People can pray from, really from anywhere, and it works, you know? This was one of the things that was so interesting to me when I came into the science of mind. Because we talked about doing long distance treatment for somebody who was on the other side of the country. And, and it's like, well, I don't know, can that work if they're not right here sitting in front of me? And the science of mind is very clear, absolutely, because the person being in front of you has nothing to do with it. It's because we are connected in the one mind. So if my mind is connected with your mind and you happen to be on the other side of the country, well, certainly I could pray for you and it would be effective. See, who we are, I think, is more than this physical body. And this is what we have to remember, that each of us is an emanation of consciousness. We are spirit, right? We are more than the brain and the body. We're consciousness. So in the 80s, um, at the University of San Francisco, their medical school, uh, we do, we did a study. And they um, had about 400 people, just under 400 people in this study. And they were all cardiac patients. Um, and it was a double-blind study. So people didn't know which group they were in. You know? And uh, so they didn't know if they were in the group that was getting prayed for or if they were in the group that was not getting prayed for. And so, as you can imagine, the prayed for group did much, much better. They had fewer days in the hospital. They healed quicker. They required less medication. They had less pain. All of it, all of it, all of it. Sounds great. So I think prayer for us, I think, has sometimes been minimized in the science of mind teaching to people just getting what they want. And sometimes people come to me and say, well, I don't understand. I, you know, if I can treat for what I want, why didn't I get it? And, and I think there are lots of answers to that. Because sometimes what you want would be absolutely dangerous for you or someone else. And maybe that's why the universe did not support that. Um, I think we can pray for a specific, or we can pray for the highest good of all concerned. And people often ask, which is it? And the answer is, yes. <laughs> it's both. It's both. You know, as we grow in our metaphysical understanding, I think part of the journey is to pray for specifics because that's how we learn that the law of mind works, that the law of mind is responding. Okay? But then I also realize that the infinite mind, the infinite mind of God, may in fact actually know a tiny bit more than I do, which is why I also want to say this or something better for the highest and greatest good of everyone concerned. Now, both of them work. Both of them work. And I'm not saying you should do one and not the other, or over the other. But the highest good, I believe, and the studies have shown that when people are praying for someone else's highest good, our highest and greatest good, um, when it's not specific, the prayers are actually more effective. I think that's just fascinating. So essentially what we're saying into the universal mind is, you know, on this person's behalf, may the best thing happen, the, which is like saying, thy will be done. Because we believe in the science of mind that God's will for each of us is absolutely the best. So um, Meister Eckhart was a, a Catholic theologian. He was a German mystic. And he said, most people use God like a cow for the cheese and milk uh, that the cow can give you. And, and so that is kind of like my bellboy Santa Claus hitman experience. But Einstein said 
the most important question we ask is, is the universe friendly? Is the universe we live in a friendly place? And so we all have to decide that. For me, I think the universe is basically, foundationally, fundamentally, it is a friendly place. And yes, there are seemingly unfriendly things that go on, but that doesn't mean that that's the whole universe. Right? So for me, I live in a friendly universe. I hope you will come to that conclusion yourself. Because what that says to me is that if I live in a friendly universe, that life is for me, that God is for me, the universe is for me. And by for me, I mean for my highest and greatest good, for my highest and greatest expression of life. So I, I, I also think that I heard this early on when I came into metaphysical teaching, and this was really helpful to me. Um, and I believe I heard it from Johnny Coleman, who had a big uh, church in Chicago, uh, Christ Universal Temple. And she said at one of our events in religious science, she said that the highest form of prayer was thanksgiving before receiving. Now, I certainly understood praying after I had received, oh, thank you, God, thank you, God, thank you, God, for the goodies. But to give thanks before the demonstration, before the healing, before the greater good came into my life, this was new to me. And so I thought, oh, I, well, I can do that. I, I think I can start to do that. I will start to give thanks in advance for the healing, for the demonstration, for the peace of mind that I want to have. So I think that there are several things that help, help us when we're going to pray. And the first, I think, is you should relax if you can, if at all possible. Now, certainly there are times when I'm driving on the freeway and I see something and I have to pray. That is not the time for me to go into a full-blown meditation, of course. I'm driving the car, but I try to be in a relaxed state and focus on what I'm doing, that now is the time of prayer. I think for myself, and I have found this to be very effective, I'm, I'm a very visually oriented person, and I think a good percentage of the population is. So for me, I like to visualize the end result, the healing that I'm praying about or for. I think that it helps if you, if you really care about it. You know, if you bring some strong emotion to it. In Living the Science of Mind, Ernest Holmes says that feeling is intelligently directed emotion. Is that right? Well, maybe not. Maybe I've said that completely wrong. I'll look it up. I'll tell you next time. OK. No, feeling is intelligently directed creation. That's it. I'm sorry. I just had to get the little gray cells to move around a little bit there. Um, I think. Those things all work. Now, about what not to do, I think that we cannot infringe on somebody else's free will. You know? So I will tell you, and this has happened to me again and again through the years, where somebody comes to me and they want me to pray. And what they want me to pray is for someone to do something different than they're doing. It seems kind of reasonable, doesn't it, at first, sight, at first thought? you know? And so the example is like, I want you to pray for my kid to stop drinking. Well, you know, that's loaded. That's just loaded, you know? Um, uh, not from the drinking. I mean, it's just, it's just a loaded <laughs> request. That is a loaded, loaded request, right? Because we understand that, you know, nobody does anything until they're ready, right? And so people have to drink until they're ready to stop drinking. And so could I manipulate with my prayer and just say, you know, get them to stop drinking, stop drinking? Yeah, that, that, might, that might work. But I think ultimately what we've done is that we've violated somebody's free will. And I don't think that that's ever karmically the correct thing to do. So when somebody says to me, will you pray for my son to stop drinking, I can say, I will pray with you and for you to see the perfection of God in your son. I will pray with you and for you to know that there is a place within your son that there's not hunger or thirst for anything that isn't for his highest and greatest good. I will pray with you and for you to know that your son is harmonious and peaceful and all is well in his world. That's what I can pray for. But to get in there and kind of manipulate his behavior, I feel like I'm violating his free will. And I think it's karmically incorrect. How would you like it if somebody said, I'm praying for you to do, and it's 180 degrees from what you were doing? 
And I'm praying for you every day to be different than who you are. First of all, you know, when we get the message that who we are is not okay, it never feels good. Nobody likes that. You know, and so it's like, all right, so you want me to be other than who I am, and then I'll be okay? No, 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 all bets are off there. All bets are off. So, so I think what not to do is not infringe on somebody else's free will. Why? Because it's just karmically incorrect. I believe, again, that we can depend on the universe. We can depend on God. Now, Joel Goldsmith, who is a writer, a metaphysician, who I'm very, very fond of, and we read him a lot here in our church, he said, ultimately, we want to develop our consciousness to the point that what we do is that we simply go to God for God. We're going to God to be in God's presence because he says, how would it be if the, what, what kind of a relationship would you have with God if the only time you went to God is when you want something? I mean, if you had a friend like that in your life, you'd see them coming down the driveway and you'd shut the front door. Right? It's like, oh my God, i got to pretend I'm not home because all they do is want, 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 want. My mother used to say that. You kids want me to death. And I think, well, we did. We did, you know. And, um, and I think people do a similar thing with God. It's all about they're trying to use God to get their way. Now, I believe that it's absolutely um, God-ordained that we are supposed to work with the law to move our life forward in healthy and constructive ways. But Goldsmith says we should go to God for God, just simply to be in God's presence. And so where is God? We say God is everywhere, but God is also within. And so he's directing us to turn our attention inward to become still like we did earlier in the service and just have those few minutes of inward focus and attention and reflection. So, and so, all right, I agree with that. But you know, everybody has to start where they are. Everybody has to start where they are. So, you know, I understand if, if what you need today is a working vehicle in your life, you may not be in a place where you just want to go to God for God. You want to pray so that you can get your car, so you can get to work, and on and on and on. So this is why I say we have to start where we are. But know that the ultimate use of our teaching is not to use God to get things. Right? I think that's I think that's a stage in our spiritual development, right? Now, I don't think God has any issue with us needing things on earth. I mean, we're on earth. We all need stuff, right? But what, what is on our plate right now? What's, what's present in our life that we could bring prayer to? Uh, the first time I had treatment from a practitioner, I will tell you, um, I was in a class with Terry Cole Whitaker. Remember Terry Cole Whitaker? And she used to do these big classes around Southern California. And um, although my brother and I had grown up in the same room for many years, um, there were enough years between us that we, we didn't really get along that well. And so uh, now we'd both been off to college. We hadn't lived in the same room for years. I'm living in California. He's back on the East Coast. And he calls me and says, I'll be out on Friday. I'm going to stay with you for a week, OK? And it's like, oh, OK. And I hung up the phone. Oh, God. That was just like the worst news I could imagine. Like, oh my, what am I going to do with him for a week? It was bad enough that we used to live in the same room. But now, you know, then we got older and we could be apart from you. But I, I just went off on this in my mind. I was just imagining every bad scenario that there could be. And so I went to my class with Terry. And, uh, and they said prayer was available with a practitioner after the class. And so I spotted some woman who looked not very threatening to me. And I sat with her, and she prayed with me. And my brother showed up on Friday, and we had an incredible visit, an incredible visit. It was like, where did this come from? How was this even possible? Because this had nothing to do with what my level of belief was, it was really the practitioner who had a much greater faith and a much greater belief than I did in that instance. So, so I had this wonderful healing. And it's like, can this happen again with other things? And sure enough, it absolutely did. You know, in Science of Mind, our prayer always is about changing our mind, right? Not to influence God. Because like I said, that has not been very successful in most cases. Also, I think about it, and I think a God I, excuse me, a God that I could influence with my prayer is probably a pretty puny God. You know, I mean, think about it. 
a God that we could that we could influence with prayer, a God that would say yes to some prayers but not others. That's like that's a really small God because what that translates to in my mind is a God who's so involved, he's saying, you get to eat, but oh, I'm sorry, you get to starve to death today. And you get to be healed, but oh, I'm sorry, you're going to have to die. I, no, that's not God. God is a principle of life and a principle of love and a principle of intelligence. You know, very, very, very spiritual people have physical challenges sometimes. Some of them are right here in this room. Ernest says prayer is a movement of thought along a definite line for a specific purpose, right? So the major function of prayer is not to change the conditions. It's for us to connect with the divine, for us to connect with the transcendent, to know that we are one with God, to remind us of our identity in spirit, to remind us that as spiritual beings, we are infinite in space and time, and we are eternal immortal spiritual beings. You know, I'm very fond of Job in the Old Testament, uh, because, uh, it, it, and it says early on in the book of Job that Job, um, Job was perfect. Wow, that's a lot. Job was perfect, right? But then the story unfolds, and Job goes through hell. I mean, he really does. Job really loves God. He's devoted. Right? But in this particular story, he loses his family, he loses his children, um, he becomes disfigured, he loses uh, his wealth, it, it really, really everything. Right? And his friends give him advice. Because you know friends like to do that, don't they? Friends like to give advice. You know what you should do. Hmm, what should I do? And Job rejected all of their advice. Job rejects their advice. And I'll let you, well, we'll talk about that story another time. So anyway, so Carl Jung said, when we are faced with mystery, what else can we do but stand in it? You know, meaning, things that have meaning in our life have their own timetable. And I do think that some things, um, spiritual things, because the spiritual path is filled with paradox, there are some things that remain a mystery to us. You know, great, great spiritual beings who've been on the face of the earth have often encountered physical problems because that was how they made their exit. That was how their soul was able to move on to the next thing. But I was reading something really interesting about Ramana Maharshi, who was probably the greatest Indian saint. And he had cancer. And at night, the cancer would be more painful. And he would be screaming. And you know, he had devotees who came from all over the world to study with him and learn from him. And, and they would be very disturbed because they'd hear him in his room just screaming in agony. And it's like, my God, what is this about? What kind of a teacher is this? What, he's, what is he going to teach us? And in the morning, often cancer is less painful for people. And so he would gather his students together, and he'd say, you're confusing me with my body. You know, the meaning for you in this illness is that, what? You know, because people are like, well, if I could just understand why, if I could just understand why, if I could just understand why. After years, I think why is a pointless question. I got to tell you, I just think, you know, why, you know, there's not a good answer to why. What is this about, you know? I think that... Um, and Ernest Holmes is very clear on this in our textbook. He says, the soul that knows its own immortal existence severs the tie that binds it to the body, and the soul rises freely and unencumbered. So even great spiritual teachers, their soul at some point has to leave the body. right? And so that may mean that there's something physical that contributes to that or not. See, I think. And this is what Ramana Maharshi was trying to teach his students there, I believe. He says that there's pain, but, but there doesn't have to be suffering, right? which is a new thought to me. But you know, that's what we teach. We are a new thought church. You know, that there may be pain, but there doesn't have to be suffering. Wow. So physical illness does not mean spiritual imperfection. See, I think in metaphysical churches, there's a lot of shame when people get sick. Yeah, and, and, and in the old days, 
And this used to really infuriate me, and I'm, I'm a much more peaceful person now, so I don't react as violently to it as I used to, is when people used to say, well, how did you create that illness? What was in your consciousness that you got sick? Because there used to be a part of me that just wanted to rise up very quietly and punch them in the nose for saying that. And now I don't, honestly, I don't, I don't feel that way anymore, but I think that they're very limited in their thinking when they even ask the question, because physical illness does not mean spiritual imperfection. Maybe that is exactly what that soul needed to experience before they can move on to whatever is next. So anyway, those are my thoughts on praying today. Let's do that together now. So I would invite everyone to turn your attention inward with me for a moment. And as we become still together, we remember that right here, the place we're on, we stand is holy ground. That God is present in its entirety, right where we are. So God has intelligence and love and beauty and order and truth and abundance and creativity and joy. God in its fullness is right where we are. We are surrounded and filled with the spirit of the living God. And in this awareness of our oneness with God, I further know that we are all connected with each other on the unseen side of life. That each and every one of us here, we are connected with all beings everywhere. And so in this awareness of our oneness with God and with each other, I speak the word for us today. That our hearts and minds are open and we know that when we pray, we are changing our mind, not God's. I know that the universe that we live in is a friendly place. And so I know the universe is supporting us in every decision, in every act we make. So today we include in our prayer our family members and friends, our parents and children, all of our loved ones, everyone we hold near and dear. And we see them in our mind's eye. And we wrap our spiritual arms around them, knowing that right where they are, God is fully present that they too are healed and blessed and uplifted. We let our prayer be a blessing in the world that we live in. So with regards to all discordant situations, we know God is present even in the midst of that. We claim peace and harmony in the world. We claim healing. We claim divine order and restoration for all people everywhere because we know God is present in everyone, waiting to be brought forth into perfect expression. We bless our church. We bless all churches everywhere, all paths. We bless synagogues and temples and mosques and ashrams. Every path to God, even no path, we bless them all. And I know that we're blessed by coming together today in consciousness, that we are all uplifted, that the grace of God truly is upon us, and there is healing for each and every one. So with an open, gracious, full heart, I say thank you, God, that this is the truth. I release this word into God's perfect law. I know it's done, and so it is. Together we all say, amen. All right, we'll sing one time together. All right, I invite you to hold your gift over your heart and we'll say our statement of giving together. From the love of pure spirit within me, I bless this gift. I send it forth to heal and bless and prosper. It is evidence of my faith and belief. It does good work in the world and returns to me multiplied abundantly. Thank you very much.
Jody Siegel. Thank you so much, Jody. You can get Jody's music at jodysiegel.com. It's S Siegel, pardon me, S I E G E L. So thank you so much, and thank you to our wonderful Sam and Karen. So, uh, regarding donations, for those of you here in the sanctuary, we have some boxes in the foyer as you're exiting the sanctuary today where you can drop off your donations. For those of you watching us virtually, uh, you can uh, donate several ways. One is to call into the church office up to 30 minutes after the service. That's 818-762-7566. And you can uh, do your donation via credit or debit card. You can go to our website, nhcrs.org, 
forward slash give, and that takes you straight to the donation page where you can make a one-time or recurring, set up recurring donations. Or you can text the word give to area code 818-457-3419. And uh, we're just reminding folks also that if you shop on Amazon, you join Amazon Smile and select our church as a recipient of donations, that every time you purchase something, uh, the church does get a donation, doesn't cost you anything. And you'll find us listed under Church of Religious Science, North Hollywood. And uh, so any way that you are finding to support us, just know how much we appreciate it. We love being here to support you as well. Prayer with a Practitioner, speaking of prayer, <laughs> is available uh, after service for those of you watching virtually. Uh, you need to be on Zoom. So if you're on Facebook Live, just go to our website and join us on Zoom. And um, we will put you in a one-on-one -on -one breakout room with a practitioner for prayer. Here in the sanctuary, please come forward to the front of the sanctuary if you'd like a practitioner to pray with you. You also have the option of writing out a prayer request and dropping it in the prayer request boxes in the foyer and just indicating that you might want a phone call from a practitioner and let us know the best times to reach you. You can also call uh, into the church office and leave a voicemail message for any prayer requests you may have. That's option four on our phone menu. Or you can send prayer requests to us uh, via email, prayer at nhcrs.org. Wednesday evening service with Reverend Sidney, who's back there being tech techie today with us. <laughs> So first, Wednesday evening service with Rev. Sydney. That's this coming Wednesday, September 8th. Meditation at 6.50, service at 7. Uh, starts right at 7. And we'll be here in the sanctuary or on uh, Facebook Live and Zoom. And Rev. Sydney's uh, topic this week is sacred chaos. She'll explore how even though we long to actualize the divine order and harmony we read about, Sometimes our realities look a lot different from you know, what we idealized or imagined. And that's not necessarily a bad thing. I'll be joining Rev. Sydney, and I can't wait to hear about that. Our youth church is open. I see a couple of parents here who have uh, brought their kids in. Welcome back. And uh, youth of all ages are welcome back for our 9.45 a.m. service. Rising Strong workshop, uh, workshop with Reverend Sidney will be on Saturday, September 25th from 10 a.m. to 1 p.m. This is going to be in person only. Uh, it's inspired by Brene Brown's book, Rising Strong. And Reverend Sidney's workshop will be a practical and uh, spirited experiences, this experience to lovingly explore the stories we tell ourselves about why we can or can't, are, or aren't. The cost is $30, and you can sign up for it on our website. The Essential Ernest Holmes class by Reverend Sidney will be teaching it. <laughs> There'll also be a class on how to not overcommit. No. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you have all this enthusiasm, Rip Sydney. Uh, 10 Tuesdays, so this is beginning September 28th from 6.30 to 9.30 p.m. And that class will be in person and on Zoom. And this is an awesome class. Uh, students gain a holistic awareness of Ernest Holmes' thoughts and come to see that um, many of the questions about how to apply the science of mind principles to their lives were addressed by our founder himself at one time or another. So the cost is 245 if you pay upfront, 270 if you pay in two installments of uh, 135. And it's, uh, again, you can sign up on the website. And this class, by the way, is a prerequisite for anyone who's interested in taking practitioner training further down the road. 
We're inviting you all to join in the fun and looking uh, for people to help host our services on Facebook Live. It's relatively easy and really a lot of fun, fun team of people. If you're interested, uh, please call the church office and uh, let us know and we'll put you in touch with the right people. The women's group will not be meeting today. I uh, normally meet on the first Sunday of the month, but we'll uh, begin again next, uh, next month. Our men's group will meet today from 11 to 11.30 on Zoom, and then going forward, we'll only be meeting on the uh, first Sunday of the month in the Ernest Holmes room. Our Zoom virtual patio, uh, we continue to allow people to gather on Zoom before and after our services. Uh, if you can't be here in person, it's a way to stay connected with the congregation. And our Zoom meditation continues Monday through Saturday from 8 to 8.15 a.m. I see a lot of you here in person. We've been seeing each other on Zoom all this time. It's so great to see your faces right here, <laughs> as well as virtually during the week. So uh, with all that, just any information uh, that you're looking for that, uh, about what's going on here, you heard something, you forgot the details, just go to our website, nhcrs. Dot org and you'll find the information. You can also sign up for our weekly e and monthly newsletters there. And with that, I'm going to step down as we can all rise and sing the peace song. <laughs> So please repeat after me. I'm at home in the heart of God. My life is anchored in truth. I can never be separate. I live in the consciousness of peace. I release all fear. I am living love. Amen. Thank you.